Perfect. All right. So let's just go through really quickly the specs. You know, I'm obsessed with the test specifications. That's how we make sure we understand what's going on. So the 5025 is broken up into five um, sections. You've got language and literacy. So that's going to be your ELA, math, social studies, science, and then health and physical education. Okay. Now notice here that the bulk of the test is going to be language arts and math. That is the bulk of the test, obviously, because those are the um, heaviest hit areas. Now, the first thing you wanna do whenever you are working on an, uh, any exam is you wanna go through the specs. So this is what we call the blueprint. This piece right here is the blueprint. That tells you what's on the exam and at what frequency. Notice here, we have 30% for language arts, my dog just showed up. 30% for language arts, 25% for math. So 55% of this test is just the language and literacy and mathematics. And then we have some social studies, science, and then health, physical education. And the reason being when you're an early childhood teacher, you're doing it all. You're the PE teacher, you're the social studies teacher, you're the language arts teacher. So that's why they do it this way. So this is the blueprint, but then the next page, which is even more detailed, is the test specification. I'll link this up in the um, in the description below, but I just want you to know that um, you can get this yourself, okay? And this is how we write our books. We look at this and we make sure that in our books, we cover this and we cover this and all of this. We go through each thing and make sure that there is content, questions, and everything like that for that. So let's just take a quick look at language and literacy, and I'm not gonna read this to you because it is very lengthy, but here we have those foundational skills. Now I just posted a video on foundational skills called the Fab Five of Reading. Um, I posted on YouTube and Facebook, so definitely watch that. We also have other videos that will help you, but that one's a brand new one that just came out, I believe on Wednesday. And you know, go through each one of these things if you don't know what they're talking about here, Google it, you know, make sure you can find it in some of our publications and on and, and in our videos, but you may need to, you know, Google some things. Let's say you don't know what a CVC or a VC is. Now let's talk about this because this happens to be something that you'll see a lot on. CVC stands for consonant, vowel, consonant. So a word like cat, C is the consonant, a is the vowel, C is the consonant, right? So you, you're gonna need to understand those. A CVC word is a consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel word, like make. So understanding those will help you. I know that if you've never been a teacher before, you're like, what does that even mean? So get in there and look at that. And if you, if you just take this and copy it and put it into Google, you can, um, a bunch of stuff will pop up, okay? Now, I know you don't wanna Google everything, you'd rather have a book and I'm working on it, but it's just not ready yet. So I wanna make sure you're ready if you're taking this test early on. Again, we have literature and informational text. Here's something to know about this. On most teacher certification exams that have to do with um, a literacy program, they want you to have a balanced literacy program, meaning that you're using literature like stories but you're also using informational text. So look for those answer choices that have a balance. We don't wanna just be reading stories and we don't wanna just be reading informational text. We wanna have that balance because students are gonna to need to be you know, balanced readers. They're gonna to need to have skills in all of those areas. And look, even early on, even in the pre-K grades, they're asking you to cite specific textual evidence. This is key when it comes to, um, teaching students how to read and support their claims, citing specific textual evidence. Now that doesn't mean they have a bibliography, you know, that's a little bit high level for a third grader or second grader, but those are things like where in the text did you see that? Or where in the text did you learn that? That's setting students up for using evidence to support. Now, something else I wanna tell you about this test specification, all of this language here, all of it, and it goes on and on and on and on. That is in the correct answer choices on the test. 
So being familiar with this, let me just show you. Um, look at this. Number five, knows the role of text complexity in reading development. The term text complexity is a good word. We want to help students understand complex text. So if you see something like that in the answer choices, I would pay attention because it's probably the right answer. Look at this here, multiple text leveling systems. Another good word that you're using multiple text leveling systems, which means you're determining the levels of text based on different types of data. Maybe it's Lexile, maybe it's reading levels, maybe it's AR, whatever it is, you're using multiple text leveling systems, okay? The term developmentally appropriate is big on a pre-K three, um, early childhood, elementary ed test, because you wanna make sure the things that you're doing are developmentally appropriate, okay? So really get in and explore the test specification. And you can see that it goes on for everything, speaking and listening, mathematics. You know, we have understands prerequisite skills. You're gonna wanna know what these are. Now, subitizing, I didn't know what subitizing was until I wrote a K-6 book. Subitizing is when students can instantly identify numbers. So let's say you have a dice or a die. Yeah, pair of die, pair of dice, die, one die. Um, and it's got the five dots on it. And students know by those five dots, that's five. Or three dots, that's three. Right away, automaticity, subitizing. So some of you who are new to teaching, subitizing, you probably have never seen that before. And also with math, um, you know, it's new. We don't do borrowing anymore. We call it regrouping. So there's a lot of common core in there. So I'm going to show you a couple other resources you can use for this um, before the end. I'm going to show you where to get the common core um, information for both ELA and math. But again, this, this specification works really well. Again, this is the blueprint. This tells you the overall what's on the exam and at what frequency. But then this gets into the nitty gritty. This is the specifications, the specifics of the test. And knowing this and understanding the language in here and being on the lookout for the language in here is going to help you on this exam. The one thing I love about ETS is that they provide you with such an amazing blueprint and test specification. It's actually one of the best that I've ever seen. And I, I <clears throat> excuse me, I evaluate tests for a living. So this is really, really good stuff. I mean, it's just got so much information here. And um, like this, evaluates the appropriateness of a particular piece of writing for a specific task and purpose. You will probably see that in an answer choice in one way or another. Make sure you pay attention to that. So knowing what's going on in this test specification is going to help you tremendously on the early childhood and on any um, ETS Praxis exam. Okay, now let's just go down here. Um, you've got it for everything. Here we've got science. The thing about science in um, early childhood is that we always want to be about inquiry. Look at here, scientific inquiry and across disciplines, meaning we're showing students how science is applicable to earth space, physical science, and in their daily lives. So understanding how it's relevant to their real life. Now, again, I also have um, a good words, bad words video on YouTube and on Facebook that kind of tells you what to look for in these particular um, tests. But when we're talking about science, curiosity, inquiry, the scientific process, teaching students how to formulate questions, communicate information to help explain the world. We're trying to show students that these kind of crazy concepts are actually very real world and affect their daily lives, right? Then it goes in here to more specifics about science. You're getting into states of matter, um, energy, and some of these concepts you may not have seen in the last 20 years. If you've been working as an accountant and you decided you want to become a physical, or you want to become an early childhood education teacher, you may not have um, you may not have paid much attention to you know states of matter in a while or electricity. <clears throat> Excuse me, 
you might need to brush up on some of those concepts that you didn't you haven't seen since fifth grade or sixth grade so make sure you do that here and it's all laid out for you make sure you know all of this we've got earth space life science now just to tell you something about science science is always broken up in these manner the, in this manner and it's like this on every um standardized test you're gonna have scientific inquiry on the science test, which is gonna be your scientific method, curiosity, what I just talked to you about before, um, independent variables, dependent variables, things like that. Then you're gonna have the physical science, okay? That's gonna be matter, electrons, the periodic table, um, machines, you know, push, pull, things like that. Then you're gonna have earth space, which obviously is about the earth, and space, but it's also about volcanoes and the crust of the earth and um, weather systems and things like that. And then you're always gonna have a life science, which is bio, and that's gonna be cells, and that's going to be um, ecosystems and animals and food webs and things like that. Notice that they're not huge for the early childhood, okay? You're not gonna have to know about DNA replication on an early childhood exam. OK, you're but you are going to have to understand how living organisms interact with their natural world. You're going to have to know about, you know, behaviors and habitats and things like that. OK, and then as we get into the physical education, you know, this is something that might be foreign to you, you know, health and nutrition and P.E. if you're not a P.E. teacher. But again, you've got it all here. It's all laid out for you exactly what you want. Notice here under health, we have conflict resolution, decision making. These are all ways in which you're teaching students to learn how to interact with one another. When, with one another. And that has to do with health education, emotional health. Okay. Emotional health. That's really important. Personal family communication, all of that. Then we get into physical education. So your basic movements, motor development, um, muscular strength, but you don't need to get too specific. It's all laid out here. And then we have the creative and performing arts, which I love that this is on the test because on most tests, this has been left off because there's no time for creative arts and performing arts because there are tests we have to get the kids ready for. But on this one, it's here. So that's really good. And, you know, just understanding all of this here. Now, remember, if we go back to the blueprint, that part, health, science and performing arts is 17% of the test. So if you kind of mess up here a little bit, it's OK. This is where the bulk of the test is. Language arts and mathematics. Social science and science are the tiniest piece, only at 14% each, as you can see here. All right, so you've got some wiggle room there. And there are over, there are 120 questions. So you can miss a good amount of questions and still get, still get this, but you're gonna have to really understand what's on the test. Now, let me go to what everybody cares about, which are the practice test questions. I'm gonna give you some, um, strategies here with the practice test questions. Okay. Now, if you've taken any of our courses or if you have um, seen our, our videos, you know that I always start here first. Okay. I don't start here. Why? Because if I start here and I read all the way through and then I read the answer choices, I'm going to have to go back up and read the question again, wasting time and filling my brain with a bunch of information and, and confusing myself. Now, sometimes you'll have these long answers here, which will be easy to eliminate. In questions like this, I can't eliminate anything yet. But what it does is it sets me up for what I'm looking for in the question. So notice in A, B, C, and D, I basically have elements of literacy or elements of a story. We've got plot sequence, point of view, character development and setting. So right away in my brain, I should be thinking about, okay, this question is gonna ask me about things about a, a story and I'm gonna have to pull it out, okay? Then what I like to do is go here to the question stem. Which of the following concepts of literary structure is the teacher helping the students understand? So we're looking for literary structure. And I can see that A, B, C, and D are all pieces of literary structure. Okay, now let's go to the question. 
A teacher reads aloud where the wild things are, and then it explains what that is. A picture book with a boy named Max encountering wild monsters. The teacher then shows the students picture cards depicting scenes, and here are the key words, beginning, middle, and end. What do we have there? Beginning, middle, and end. We have a plot sequence, and A is gonna be the answer. As soon as I see beginning, middle, and end, I know that the structure is going to be this plot sequence. Now, if I had started here and read everything, and then went here and then read the answer choices, I would have to go back up and reread, second guessing myself and trying to figure out what's going on, all right? So don't do that. Look, per, you know, quickly survey your answers first, okay? Now, let me show you how that works when we look at something like number six here, okay? Let's take a look at the answer choices here. Now, A, I have gathered the facts and I know what really happened. That doesn't sound like a good answer choice to me. I'm gonna leave it out. B, I understand you and I know what is best for you. I know what is best for you. Now, you may think you know what is best for somebody, but that's usually not the right answer. Students know what's best for them as well. I believe you understood the class rules. All right, rules is on our bad words list. Usually we should use expectations. So right now, A, B, and C are looking like bad answers. Let's look at D. I respect you as a person with your own ideas and feelings. Well, isn't that a good answer choice there, especially for an early elementary school teacher, you know, telling a student, I respect you. I understand you have your own ideas. So D looks like the best answer so far. Let's read the question. Which of the following statements best illustrates active listening on the part of a second grade teacher who is helping a student solve a personal problem. Well, saying I've gathered all the facts and I know what really happened is out. I understand you and I know what is best for you, out. I believe you understood the class rules. Class rules have nothing to do with a personal problem. And D, I respect you as a person with your own ideas and feelings. Notice that before we even read the question, I already had the right answer kind of in my head. Now, that one was kind of easy because D really stands out as like an, a really good answer choice. It may not be that um, obvious, but this is coming straight from ETS. I didn't make up this question. They wrote this question. So here it is right there. That is why I say go to the answer choices first, because right away D stood out as like a nice answer choice, uh, the way in which you would interact with a young student. And then after reading the question, boom, D is my answer. And I'm not getting like caught up in this, you know, back and forth with the questions and the answers and second guessing myself. All right. Let's take a look at number five. I'm jumping around a little bit, but I really like this practice test because it, it helps. Notice that I'm gonna go, okay, I've got phonics, vocabulary, letter recognition, and phonemic awareness. All right, I can't eliminate anything in number five because those are just straight up words and I don't know what's going on. Then I go to the question stem, which of the following is the teacher trying to develop for students through the center? I still don't know. Let's read the question. A kindergarten teacher sets up a literacy center with activities that ask students to match pictures of objects of letters to correctly indicate the beginning sound, the beginning sound. Now I'm going to give you a second in order to, to um, figure this out. Now, if you just saw my, um, my video on the fab five of reading, I went through this and I posted it in the groups and on our Facebook page, so you'll be able to see it there. But notice we talked about sound and we're not looking at letters. Um, well, we're looking at pictures of objects with letters, but we're focusing most on the sounds. And if we're focusing most on the sound, what are we doing? Well, we're talking about phonemic awareness because phonemic awareness is sounds. Let me read you their answer explanation. And you can see that the, the other reason why I love this particular test and, and ETS is that they give you these awesome answer explanations here. And remember, we do the same in our books. The answer explanations 
are really important because they tell you about the other answer choices in there. And so even if you get this correct, I recommend reading the answer choice or the answer explanation because it will tell you even more information. So let's take a look here. Phonemic awareness involves matching words or pictures with beginning sounds. Choice A is incorrect because phonics involves understanding how letters combine to make sounds. You'll see that in that video that I just posted when I, I use an example of a P and an H together, make a F sound. Well, you have to know that that rule, that phonics rule, that spelling rule. And in this case, we're not talking about spelling. We're just talking about sounds. So when we talk about sounds only, we're talking about phonemic awareness. You can see B here. B involves building students' receptive vocabulary and expressive vocabulary, which is not what's going on here. And C involves students identifying letters regardless of color, size of letter, blah, blah, blah. So you can see that D is the correct answer. And we have this really awesome answer explanation in here. So this is really, um, really helpful when you guys are studying. Now, I know you want a book. I know you want more practice test questions. But if you can get good at evaluating these um, questions and answers, you'll be better off. All right. Let's take a look at number four. I'm going to go backwards one more and then we're going to move on to math. So we have paraphrasing ideas, spelling words correctly, expressing speech in print, and capitalizing proper nouns. All right, so which of the following is the most appropriate focus for three-year-old students? Well, right away, three-year-olds, I can cross off spelling words correctly. If they're three, they're not spelling. I mean, unless they're like geniuses, they're probably not spelling. And capitalizing proper nouns are out as well. Paraphrasing ideas. Paraphrasing ideas is a little high level, but you know, a three-year-old might be able to tell you what happened in a story or something like that. So I would keep A and C, all right? And I would take out B and D because we're talking about three-year-olds here, okay? So right away, just by reading the answer choices first and then reading this question stem that's stuck at the bottom, I've already eliminated 50% of the answer choices and now I have more of a chance of getting this correct. Let's go up to the top here. After a visit to a rescue squad, Ms. Espinanza asks her third year, three-year-old students to help her write a thank you letter to the rescue squad. All right, that's key there, thank you letter. She records the students' responses on a large sheet of chart paper as the students share their answers. So she's at the front of the room. She's like, what did you guys think of our visit? And they're like, it was interesting. And so she writes down interesting. And some kid says, I like the, um, the fire truck. And they put fire truck on there. And so they're kind of compiling ideas. While writing, Ms. Espinosa focuses on the student's attention on several early literacy skills. What are we trying to do here? Well, we're not paraphrasing ideas. We're expressing speech to print because the students are expressing themselves. I like the fire truck. I like the the well, whatever they're doing at the rescue squad. Um, I like the CPR demonstration, whatever it is. And she's writing it on the board. So they are expressing it and she's showing them what that looks like in print. So C is the correct answer there. But right away, I got rid of B and D because I know three-year-olds are probably not spelling words correctly. And they're probably not understanding the rules of capitalization when it comes to proper nouns. That is not developmentally appropriate. Paraphrasing ideas is also high level, but you know, sometimes if you're asking students to sequence a story when they're little like that, that could be considered paraphrasing, but C is the best answer. And again, let's see what the um, answer explanation says here. We have the most appropriate focus for three-year-olds is expressing speech. Choices A, B, and D are incorrect because concepts are not appropriate for three-year-olds. Now that's something you wanna be on the lookout for in incorrect answers on an early childhood exam. The correct, an the correct answer will be more developmentally appropriate and the incorrect answer will be, um, you know, much more appropriate, all right? So let's take a look at some questions for math here so I can show you, there we go, all right, so. Again, I want to look at the answer choices first and let me just get my answer key here. I do nothing without an answer key. Never go live on Facebook without an answer key. So I have that. But um, let's take a look at number 10. So we have A, comparing quantities, B, describing quantities, C, ordering quantities, 
quantities and D, decomposing quantities. So what I wanna pay attention here are just the first words, comparing, describing, ordering, decomposing, all right? Now, let's take a look. Which of the following whole number concepts does the lesson best reinforce? Again, I can't eliminate anything yet. I got to read what's going on. So we have it here. A second grade teacher has each student select a card at random that is marked with a three digit number. Students then model their numbers with base 10 blocks on a value mat. So we have, here are some clues here. We have a three digit number, but then the students are using their base 10 blocks. Well, three digit numbers are hundreds, but we're using base 10 to show what, they're, what they are. Well, we're not comparing because if it were comparing, I would have two different numbers and I would be looking at them and determining the similarities. Describing, perhaps maybe you might think that that is, um, the answer because you're kind of describing it with your base 10 blocks, I would keep it. We're not ordering. We're not saying like this one is first, this one is second, this one is third on a number line. And typically with ordering for early childhood, you're going to be looking at a number line and we don't have a number line. And then we have decomposing, which is the correct answer here because we have three digit numbers and then I'm kind of showing them in base 10 blocks, which means I'm taking that three digit number and I'm breaking them up into tens. So that's going to be decomposing. But notice comparing and ordering would be out right away. And then I have B and D left and decomposing is best. Describing quantities is not really something we do. I mean, we do describe, but decomposing is a big piece of early math where we kind of take a number and decompose it so students can see that it's made up of smaller pieces, all right? Let's take a look at, let's do number 11. Again, I'm here, I can't do anything. I have to figure out what's going on. And then I read this, which of the following is the most appropriate to use to correctly answer the question? All right, the, ga uh, the gasoline tank in a car holds 15 gallons when full. If there are seven gallons of gasoline in the tank, how many gallons of gasoline are needed to fill? So what I'm asking here is how many more gallons? And in this case, this is a subtraction problem. Don't get, don't make it too complicated. What would you do to figure out this problem? You would subtract, okay? Let me try to find another good one that we can, oh, I love this one, 14. Look at this. This big old question for number 14. People are like, oh my God, I don't know. All right, let's just look at the, um, answer choices, pattern recognition, conservation of numbers. Let me scroll up a little bit. Intuitive concept of chance, data collection, organization, and display. Well, just looking at the picture, I have red, yellow, blue, and they're organized, right? So D is looking like a good answer choice for me. And I have here, which of the following math skills does the activity reinforce? Now, also remember that a really important skill for even the young students is data um, organization. In fact, in a lot of um, societies that are beating us in, in the math game, they don't focus on these old fashioned algebra skills. They actually are showing students how to manage large data sets and make decisions based on those data sets actually the way we use math every day, right? In my business, I look at data. In your classroom, you look at data. So you don't use like crazy um, geometric equations every day. But what you do is you organize data and figure out how it can help you make decisions. And in this case, that might be what we're doing here. So I like D. I've got that as my selected um, answer. Let's read what's going on. A preschool teacher has each of the 10 students in a class pick their favorite color of sticky note from red, yellow, and blue. Students then work with the teacher to create a chart of their color selections. Well, you might be, first of all, B is out. Conservation of numbers, there, there are no numbers here. We have yellow and blue and red and sticky notes. You may be like, well, there are two here and five here and three here, but we're not conserving numbers here. 
intuitive concept of chance has to do with probability, which is like picking something out of a hat. So that is not what's going on here. And you may want to, you may say pattern recognition because you're putting it in order, but there is no pattern here. If it were like a circle, square, circle, square, or two squares, two circles, two squares, and you were showing that, that would be pattern recognition. What we're doing here is we're organizing data. We're putting all the reds together, we're putting all the yellows together, and we're putting all the blues together. And we're, you know, showing that when you do that, you have a data display. So D is the correct answer there, all right? Let's try one more in the math department and then I'm going to um, move to some other stuff. OK, so we have let's look at number 15 here, um, which of the fault. Well, we've got classifying, counting, patterning, ordering again, can't cross anything out. Which of the following concepts is most closely aligned with the determinations of the, the teacher is having the students make? All right. So the kindergarten teacher has students determine how many students are absent for that day if there are enough snack cups for each student, how many balls are taken outside during recess and how many are going to be brought back in, right? I'm gonna give you a second to take a look at that. Now classifying is when you classify numbers, three digit numbers, two digit numbers, negative numbers, positive numbers, things like that. There's nothing really classifying here. So I'm gonna cross off A. Counting, well, how many students? Is there enough? How many balls? We're counting, aren't we? So I'm gonna keep B. Pattern, patterning, we're not really looking at a pattern here. If you're gonna choose pattern, it's gonna be pretty obvious. There's gonna be some sort of way in which we're looking for a pattern. And I don't see a pattern here. And then ordering, is not what we're doing here because ordering would be again on a, on a um, number line. In this case, we're simply counting. How many students are absent that day? How many empty desks do we have? One, two, three. Okay, there are three students absent today. If there are enough snack cups, well, if we have 10 kids in class, do we have 10 snack cups? And we count the snack cups. Go with the obvious answer. Don't think they're trying to trick you, all right? They are just trying to figure out that you have the basic um, understanding of what a pre-K three or um, early childhood education teacher needs to have. And in this case, it's just counting. So try not to get, you know, you could, this is what I see a lot of people do. Those of you who are um, sketchy test takers, you guys will go, well, it could be classifying because we're classifying how many students and you start to talk yourself into the wrong answer. Keep it simple. Don't, don't make it complicated. You are simply counting how many, how many, how many, look at this, how many, how many, that's a counting skill. So keep it simple there. All right. All right. Let's just kind of Go down through, let me get my, um, are we in social science next? Yes, that is social science. Give me a second to look at social studies here. All right. Now you might be given something um, like this, a crazy map that you have to take a look at, all right? Now, right away, I'm gonna look at this and it says average annual precipitation, all right? And we have A, the North receives more precipitation. The driest region is in the Northeast. The Southeast receives the most. The West receives more. Okay, before I read all this, let's try and see if I can figure out what's going on just by this. And it looks like this is a, um, a chart from China. And you're gonna need to understand this in order to be a, sci a social science teacher. So we have this, the North receives more precipitation than the South. Well, I have this 500 and I have 1500. Which one's bigger? 1500. So it looks like the South receives more. And in this case, the A would be out. So A is out. B, the driest region is in the Northeast. Now you're gonna need to know your directions. So north east is the driest. I've got 500 and 1,000 here, but look at this. I've got 100 here. It looks like the northwest is the driest. So B is out. Let me make sure I'm doing this right. 
Okay, yeah, I'm on the right track, <laughs> making sure. All right, the southeast receives the most precipitation. Well, look at this, the southeast, I got 1,500, which is the most in the whole entire um, thing. And it looks like the southeast receives the most. And then here, the west receives more than the east. No, the west, I got 100, and the east, I got 1,000. And 1500. So in this situation, C is going to be the correct answer. And I didn't get all bogged down here. Now, what I would probably do is I would choose my answer here, C, and then I would just check really quickly to make sure I'm um, doing the right thing because they might have asked which of the following is not, right? So be careful there. Let's look at the question stem. The map below shows which of the following to be true. All right. If this said which of the following not to be true, then you would go with, you know, the wrong answer. But in this case, A, B and D are wrong and you have one correct C. And let's just read up here. A teacher is presenting a unit on ways in which people from different cultures deal with their physical environment. The teachers want students to understand different parts of the environment. Can affect, Look at all that. Just junk. I don't need any of that. And they put it there because it's just part of item writing. All I needed was to look at this and this, and then just double check the question stem here, and I know I'm on the right track. So that's how you can attack that. Let's go to 21. I'm gonna give you guys a second. Let me zoom into 21. If you're watching on Facebook, it might be. I want you to look at the answer choices first and see if you can eliminate anything, and then um, we'll talk about it. All right, so I, I've got this, demonstrating empathy, modeling how to show appropriate affection, encouraging students to name and discuss their feelings. So rather than just throwing something across the room saying, I am angry or I am sad or I am frustrated. D, identifying a student to be Ethan's partner and participate in center time with him. All right, Ethan, a new preschool student does not talk or play with others during center time, which of the following strategies will best help him develop interpersonal relationships? Now here we have conflict, and this is also kind of conflict because um, encouraging students to name their feelings, usually we do that, like if a student is like frustrated and throwing something, we say, okay, what are you feeling? Use your words, use your words, right? We say that with little kids. We, we need to say that with adults too, to be quite honest with you. But we say, use your words, use your words. Well, empathy is not really the point here. If I'm trying to get Ethan to have empathy, it means maybe he's not being very nice to students, other students, and we want Ethan to understand that, you know, how would you feel, Ethan, if someone did this to you? You know, that kind of thing, empathy. Um, so A is gonna be out and I'm gonna cross out C. Now how to model appropriate affection. This would be like if um, maybe if you had a student who's just like a toucher or a hugger and they're always touching the students, maybe you wanna show the student how to say thank you rather than touching other students, things like that, or um, you know, encouraging the student to be more appropriate. In this case, identifying a student to be Ethan's partner to participate in center time, we're talking about interpersonal relationships. And in this case, that would be correct. Let me just check. Yes, it is. Because interpersonal relationships have to do with peers and partners. And that's why D would be the best answer choice here. So again, figuring out you know, what's going on here, I really couldn't um, eliminate any answer choices to begin with because I have to read it. But look at this. If I just read the question stem, which of the following would best help him develop interpersonal relationships? We have this partner here. I may have had D in mind and then reading the question here or reading the scenario. This scenario here takes out the empathy, the appropriate affection and discussing feelings because that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about interpersonal relationships and helping Ethan participate with another student, right? Let's take a look at science. Let me get a good one here. Um, um, 
let's take a look at, wait, 20 is 20 science. No, 20 is social science. Sorry. Let's go to, let's go to 24 right here. This one here. Okay. So we have a demonstrating that's that a celery stalk can be peeled lengthwise, but not clockwise. Hmm. Placing celery stalks in water colored with dye and observing the results. Well, I like this observing the results. Observing is a good word in science. We observe a lot. So B looks good. A is kind of weird. I, I like B. C, collecting rainwater in a rain gauge and comparing the amount of rainfall to a plant's growth rate. Okay, I still like observing better, but I might keep C because we are doing the scientific experiment. D, planting bean seeds in paper cups, placing them on the windowsill and watering them daily. Again, no scientific um, or scientific uh, uh, process is talked about here. B still looks good to me. Let's read the question. Which of the following activities will be most effective in introducing kindergartners to the concept of how plants transport water? Well, cutting a celery stalk isn't going to do it. Placing celery stalked in colored water. This is the classic. I'm sure you did it. I mean, I did this back in the 80s. You take celery, you put it in a blue dye, and you watch the blue dye go up the celery stalk. It's like the coolest thing ever because that's what it's called um, transport. And it has to do with um, the properties of water, but it also has to do with properties of plants. And um, it goes up the celery and it turns the celery blue. It's so cool, especially for early um, childhood kids. So I still like B. Collecting rainwater in a gauge and comparing the amount of rainfall to the plant's growth. First of all, this is way developmentally inappropriate and we're not showing them. This is a little abstract. B is showing them that, that concept. And let's go with D. Planting bean seeds in paper cups and watering them daily. All right, well, watering them daily, I guess is good. And it has to do with water, but we're not able to see what's going on in terms of the transport of water up the stems and up the um, the tubes of the celery. So B is going to be the best answer choice there. All right. Let's keep going. Let's go to um, let's go to health and, and uh, physical education. Let's go here. Um, let's start with number 26. All right. So we have keeping the chin tucked keeping the knees and hips flexed, losing the curl, using hands to cushion the head for contact. So it looks like A is a good thing, keeping your chin tucked. It looks like we're, we're teaching them how to roll or something like that. Keeping the knees and hips flexed, losing the curl, using the hands. All right. Which of the following is a problem most characteristic of preschoolers forward rolling? Okay, so we know preschoolers are trying to learn the forward roll. What is the problem? Well, keeping the chin tucked is not a problem. That's actually something that, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at, okay? You're, you're, you're keeping the chin tucked. Keeping the knees and hips flexed, that doesn't have much to do with the roll. But losing the curl seems to be like it's a problem. And using hands as a cushion for the head is not necessarily a problem. Looks like losing the curl. And I don't know if you've ever seen little kids um, flapping all over the place when they try to roll, but usually that's the issue. And let's read this. A preschool teacher is teaching students the forward roll. Which of the following is a problem? So you want to focus on that problem. And there really is only one problem in this situation. All right. Let's take a look at... Um, all right, let's take a look at 30. Which of the following, let me make sure that I've got the right thing here. All right. Which of the following skills must be mastered before a child can learn to skip? Now, skipping is actually complicated. Um, so, you know, it's kind of hard to do that up, hop, hop, hop. And especially when they're little, they're trying to figure it out. All right. So running is out. Walking backwards is out, crab walking. Hopping comes before skipping. You need to learn to walk before you run and you need to learn to hop before you skip. So just a hop, hop, basic hop, and then you turn it into a skip. So that's gonna be 30 there. Now, obviously you're gonna need to know more about um, 
you know, students and their and their health education. But if you're looking for another um, study guide that will help you with this, go to the ETS website and look up the PE study guide, the PE um, ETS study companion. Now it'll have a lot more than you need, but it will have in that test specification piece. Let me just go to that. Let me see something here. Um, let me go here. Let's go Praxis PE test. Just pull it up for you guys. Here it is, study companion. We've got it here. Let me zoom in for you. There it is. And look, it's got a little bit, it's, it's got a lot, but if you look at here, student growth and development, you're going to have these sequential things that are happening, motor development, psychomotor development, things like that. That's going to help you here. So if you're struggling with the health and the PE piece, just go and look at this other one here. This is 5091, the PE, and you'll get the concepts you need there. All right, guys, thank you so much. Have an awesome Saturday. Do a little relaxation and I'll see you soon.